Very good. Um, good morning, afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, and uh, welcome. Um, this is a change of pace. Uh, usually the classes that I give are uh, text-based. Um, they uh, tend to be either biblical uh, in nature or Talmudic, Midrashic, or certainly rabbinic uh, in nature. Um, and uh, the class usually revolves around some uh, relatively intricate, uh, either literary, linguistic, or theological uh, explanation. Um, we will be doing text uh, this time. Uh, we'll be looking at the uh, texts of many of the songs uh, that were sung by the early Chalutzim, by the pioneers uh, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, up to uh, the early years, let's say the first decade of the, after the establishment of the State of Israel, I have to draw the line someplace. Uh, so we will be looking at some texts, but uh, clearly not with the uh, intensity with which we uh, have previously examined more classic texts. So um, since uh, as a segue then, uh, let me begin by sharing uh, with you uh, a Pasuk and a Rashi. Uh, when you think of uh, Hebrew songs or Jewish songs um, in the Tanakh, uh, two things come to mind. Um, one, I rejected out of hand because it's a bit negative. That, of course, is the famous line in Psalm 137 on the Harod Bavel, where our enemies and tormentors said to us, Shiru lanu mishir tzion. Uh, exactly what the shir tzion was is a matter of some uh, debate amongst the parshanim. Seems to be a consensus, though not necessarily a unanimity, that refers to the songs, the mizmorim of Tehillim, that were sung by the Levim in Beit HaMikdash, but it could very well refer to other songs as well. So I put that aside on account of its, as I said, its, it's somewhat um, a negative context and shows this one instead. Uh, when uh, uh, Father Jacob, Yaakov Avinu, uh, dispatches his sons back to Egypt, not the first time, but the second time, he tells them, And uh, as you see, the standard translation of Zimrata Aretz are things uh, that are most praiseworthy of the land. What these things were uh, is explicit. He says, ma'at sori, ma'at vash, right? Uh, some balsam, some honey, spices, pistachios, almonds, right? The, almost as though it were tu bishvat, which of course it was just yesterday. Um, uh, so these are the zimrat ha'aretz, clearly the references to fruits and nuts, meaning uh, that even during a famine, even during a famine, there were certain things that continued to grow, at least during the early years of the famine. Um, and Yaakov is suggesting that perhaps in order to mollify, to pacify the ruler of Egypt who was making things difficult for his children, that he would make a gesture to send him something. But the question is, why are these things called zimrata aretz? What connection do they have to Zion Mem Resh? Now, I must tell you that what Rashi says is lovely, and we're going to proceed on that basis, right? Rashi says that Zimrat Aretz was understood correctly by the Targum, by Onkelos, who translated it as Mishavach Aretz, things that people praise, hence the English translation, right? But then he says, why are such things called Zimra? Shahakol Nizamrin Alav Keshehu Ba'la Olam that when these things come into existence, that is to say when these trees bear the fruit or when these nuts grow, right, that people sing their praises. So indeed, Zimrat Ha'aretz are things that are praiseworthy, but they're praiseworthy particularly in the way that people sing about them. Between you and me, just parenthetically, I don't think that's the pshat. Uh, I think that the pshat would recognize that uh, the word zimora is an agricultural term. Um, it refers to a branch of a vine. 
and that there is a verb, lizamer, which is to tend to things horticulturally. So it may very well be that the pshat of Zimra Ta'aretz is that it is clearly a reference to things that grow on trees, that grow on branches, and that have to be harvested. But we'll just take the drash of Rashi at face value, and we're going to devote our attention in the coming weeks to the songs of the land of Israel. Um, and here are just a list of um, the possibilities. I don't know that we're going to have the opportunity to cover all of these, and this certainly isn't an exclusive list. Uh, if at any time um, you uh, would like us to draw our attention to some song that was a particular favorite of yours, then by all means, either put it in the chat or drop it in an email to me, uh, and I'll do my best to be able to add it to our uh, curriculum. But as you can see, uh, I've divided the songs reasonably into four categories. I call the first category, first words. And that is, the, the according to the historical records, these are the earliest songs sung by pioneers in the land of Israel, at least of which we have some historical or literary record. Now, obviously, people could have been singing for, you know, long before uh, the first Aliyah, People in the land of Israel could have been singing even long before the Biluyim came in the middle of the 19th century. But insofar as we have an historical or a literary record of Hebrew songs, then these that I've called first words are the earliest songs on record. Okay? The second category I called fighting words. I call them fighting words because these are songs that are born of conflict. They're born either of the First World War or of the Second World War or of the, uh, of, of the above ground and underground struggles against uh, the Arabs, against the British. Um, and of course, um, if we enter into the first decade of the existence of the State of Israel, born as well of the experience of the Milchemet Ma'ot, Israel's War of Independence. Um, the third category I call Love of Lamb. And those are songs that focus on particular places in the land of Israel, or that sing the virtues of the land of Israel in general. And the last category I call religious Zionism, or even as you see the parentheses, anti-religious Zionism. Those are songs that were born either of um, religious youth organizations, uh, such as B'nai Akiva, or occasionally of anti-religious youth organizations. So we'll look at those as well. Um, and, and then there was a song that was simply one of the favorites of mine, and I couldn't fit it neatly into any of the four categories. So uh, in honor of Zemer Nuga, uh, I created a fifth category called everything else. Um, so as I said, just as I, uh, as you can reasonably expect, uh, I'm going to introduce some of my favorite songs. They said, you're all invited if you wish, to let me know of what were some of your favorite songs and just uh, do my best to try to get them into our curriculum. So with that introduction aside, we can move directly to the earliest song of which there is either an historical or a literary record. Just to fill you in on um, uh, what you see here, uh, every one of the songs on the uh, source sheets has the full text of the words of the song, but there's also, as you see at the beginning, there's a link, okay? Um, if you're unacquainted with this website, the website, as you can see, is called Zemer Reshet, right? Reshet is a, like a, 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 a station. Zemer is a song, um, and it's .co.il. So this is a website that's maintained in Israel, uh, specifically for the purpose of preserving Hebrew songs. And the website um, contains the texts of the songs. It contains, if there is available, some information about the composer, about the lyricist. But more to the point, it contains, um, in most cases, several recordings of the song on the part of of either well-known or unknown uh, Israeli or other Jewish entertainers. Okay, 
So um, if we look at this our earliest song, El Yivne HaGalil, okay, the background, uh, it seems to date, or at least it, it's the earliest date to which it can be uh, located historically, is 1884. In 1884, the Baron Rothschild established a silk weaving workshop in uh, Rosh Pina. Uh, and since the work was difficult, he had to hire uh, workers. And apparently one of the workers who arrived in Rosh Pina to work in the silk weaving workshop um, came from Lebanon. Um, nobody really knows exactly what his name is. Uh, it's come down in the historical records as Chatzbani. Um, the Chatzbani is the name of a river in Lebanon, as well as the name of a town in Lebanon. It could very well be that that was his family name, or it could simply be that he was called the Chatzbani, just as nowadays we might call somebody a New Yorker. Okay? Um, and again, according to the meager historical evidence that we have, he taught this song to the other workers in the factory, having brought the song with him from his ancestral home in Lebanon, along with a tradition that the song had originated actually in the 16th century, when, if you're really up to date on your history of the land of Israel, there was an attempt, unsuccessful ultimately, to uh, reestablish some sort of Jewish settlement, specifically in the city of Tveria, uh, under the auspices of uh, of uh, the Duke of Naxos, Don Yosef Nasi, um, and uh, under the patronage uh, of his aunt, Dona Gracia Nasi. Uh, if you visit Tveria, uh, you can certainly, uh, you will certainly encounter uh, either actual remnants uh, of this uh, settlement attempt or at least local folklore about it. So again, what we have here is a song that according to the tradition, that, uh, that brought it in to uh, Israel in the late 19th century uh, has its roots in earlier attempts to settle or to colonize the land of Israel. And uh, if you click on the link, um, this is what you're going to get. I'll just simply take us to it. And um, you can look at the words either, uh, if you look at the words, follow it, you can uh, follow along with the tune. You just tell me, do you, whether you hear it? Somebody give me a thumbs up if they hear it. No. We can't, can't hear, hear it. Too. We cannot hear it. Okay, I got to try something else. Always a a possibility. Hold on, and let me go back here, and. Maybe this will do it. Let me try again. Dr. Sokolo, there is a button when you when you share screen. Pardon? Hear that. Yep, you got it. You got it. Yeah. Okay, somewhat repetitive. Um, here's a slightly different version that at least incorporates some more of the words.
Now, the, the curious thing, by the way, um, it, two things to note about the song um, itself. Um, the first is that um, it, it seems to, it, to be constructed along the lines of one of the piyutim that we might recognize from the Haggadah. Uh, that is to say, um, it, it's, uh, it moves along in the alphabetic order, right? It's built according to the acrostic of the Aleph Bet. And as you can see, there are also, um, there are also, uh, let me just get it back up. Okay. Um, that, uh, Atlit with an Aleph, Be'er Yaakov with a Bet, okay? Um, ben Shemem, Gidera with a Gimel, Deganya with a Dalet, right? Hartuv with a He. So it's constructed, it's somewhat reminiscent of Adirhu, Adirhu Yivneve To Bikarov, Bimheira, Bimheira, Biyamenu Bikarov, El Bene, the notion of building Yivne, right? It's somewhat reminiscent of, of that uh, Haggadah song. But what a curious thing, what does Atlit mean? What does Atlit mean? I'm trying to come across this is that there's also a little bit of poetic license here. Um, actually, the uh, place of Atlit. Right in, in the Galilee is actually spelled with an ayin. But it appears that at least when the song was put together in the last decade of the 19th century, there was not yet any place in Israel that began with an aleph. So since they already had an ayin, they had ein ganim, and they had ekron, so they took some poetic license and they spelled atlit with an aleph in order to have a complete aleph bet. What about, this, what about Ash, Ashkelon, Ashdod? Let's begin with I. There were no Jews living there. Oh, oh, okay, interesting. There were no Jews living there at that time. So oh. they seem to have limited it, limited it to places that were already being settled by Jews. So as I said, it would seem that there really is no, no other way in which to uh, account for it. it they, they didn't make a mistake in spelling. Which, um, which year was, just, would these songs be from? These the 30s? Hey. No, as I said, it it's, it can be traced back. Uh, it can be traced back all the way to 1884. Oh, okay, okay. But it, it again, like like many songs and like many piyutim, um, it, it also grew by accretion over time. Okay. I do want to make just one comment about ekron. Now, uh, if there were ekron, if you may recall from your Bible, was one of the five cities of the Philistines. Right, the original five towns, if you'll pardon me, uh, were Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron, Gat, and Aza. Okay, um, now uh, at, at the turn of from the 19th to the 20th century, as I mentioned, th there were no Jews yet living in Ashdod or in Ashkelon, and certainly not to that matter in Aza. Though there had been Jews living in Aza in in, in the Middle Ages during the Ottoman period. Um, but uh, no, my neighbor's family, I believe, was in Oz at that time. It, it, but there, in 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 um, in 1884, there were already Jews living in Ekron. Um, the place in which they were living, which when they moved into it, was called Ekron. Its name was subsequently changed. It's now called Mazkeret Batya. Maskeret Batya was named for one of the, uh, uh, the great uh, uh, ladies of the Rothschild family, since the settlement in Ekron was financed by the Rothschilds. The interesting thing about the settlement in Ekron is that it was the first of its kind in the history of Jewish settlement, modern Jewish settlement in the land of Israel. Um, previously, people, pioneers who came to Israel um, had to learn agriculture. That's why one of the first places in Israel to be built up in the 19th century was an agricultural school in Mikveh Yisrael. And that's where people would go in order to learn the rudiments of agriculture before they set out for wherever they were going to settle. Um, at some point, somebody had the great idea why do we have to bring people to Israel who have absolutely no idea what farming is like, and then we have to invest time and money and effort in teaching them how to farm? 
why don't we bring Jewish farmers to Israel? So at one point, a group of 10 Jewish farmers was organized. It was organized by Rabbi Shmuel Molliver, one of the uh, uh, fathers uh, of religious Zionism, one of the early leaders of the Bilu movement. And he organized this group of 10 Jewish farmers and they settled in Ekron. Now, the interesting thing is not even so much that this is, as I said, you know, the, the first time that a, a village of Jewish farmers was established in the land of Israel, but Rabbi Mulliver had a concern. And his concern was, what would these Jewish religious farmers do during the Shemitah year? His concern was that, as it was, they were able to barely make a subsistence living. And the concern was that during the year uh, of Shemitah, um, he was afraid that, you know, that their settlement would just simply come apart. So it was on behalf of these uh, Jewish religious farmers that Rabbi Shmuel Mulliver approached Rabbi Yitzchak Elchanan Specter, one of the Torah giants of Eastern Europe in the late 19th century, and secured on their behalf what today is called the Heter Mechira. That is to say, the oh, sanction. Excuse to me, sell the whole, excuse land me, the whole book written about in Israel the during the Shemitah year right so that people could continue to, to, um, to cultivate it. So it was for these farmers in Ekron that Rabbi Mulliver and Rabbi Specter produced this Heter Mechira. But the curious thing was that by the time the Heter Mechira was issued, these farmers had come under the influence of the Eidach Haredit in Yerushalayim, and they were persuaded by the rabbis in the Eidach Haredit of Yerushalayim not to abide by the Heter Mechira. So it's somewhat ironic that the people on whose behalf the Heter Mechira was originally secured were the first ones not to use it. Okay. Where did you bring them from? Where were they I mean, from? On the subject. Ah, oh, you have, yeah, to the Baron and his officers were supporting Heter Mechira, but the Muscarid Bakke people, I, 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 people I, I, I reviewed that sorry, book and gave it to a family. I don't know if anybody here. heard you because I didn't either. You want to start again, please? Um, I reviewed that book. What happened was the Baron and his officials were were supporting only Heter Mechira, and when the Muscarat Batya people said it's not good enough for us, they ran into a lot of trouble. Yeah, basically that's it. So as I said, that was just something apropos of the appearance of Ekron. Okay, moving along. And again, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to abide by a strict chronological. Uh, uh, timeline. So from 1884, we come to 1890. In 1890, we have uh, a, um, a uh, poetic composition by Chaim Nachman Bialik, uh, one of his very earliest uh, poems uh, called El Hatzipor. Um, you may know uh, it's a, an interesting fact of um, natural geography that the land of Israel is on one of the world's principal um, uh, bird migration lanes. Uh, and uh, I don't know the numbers, the hundreds of thousands, millions of, of, of birds uh, pass uh, in the vicinity of the land of Israel annually. I don't think Bialik was particularly aware of this, but he certainly knew that in the winter, birds went south and came back again in the spring. So uh, on, the, uh, on the reasonably, um, uh, uh, literally, literary, fictitious assumption that one of those birds returning to uh, Eastern Europe uh, in the spring had gone as far as the land of Israel, uh, Bialik wrote a poem to the bird, El Hatzipor, uh, as you see the opening lines, Shalom Rav Shuvech Tzipora Nechmedet, right, welcome back, uh, darling bird, Me'artzot HaChom, returning from the warmer lands, El Chaloni to my window, El Kolech Yarev to your pleasant voice, Manavshi Chalata, how much I missed it, 
Bachoref during the winter, Boazvech Meoniv, when you left these parts. And he asks the bird to bring him specific regards from the land of Israel. Now, I'm, I'm going to play you a rendition of this poem by the famous Israeli songstress Nahama Handel, but I want you to pay particular attention to the way in which she pronounces the words, because this is something that we're going to see time and again uh, when we look at early Hebrew songs. Many, maybe most, of the really early Hebrew songs were written by Jews who grew up in Eastern Europe and who were accustomed to the Ashkenazic pronunciation of Hebrew. Um, not merely the Ashkenazic pronunciation of Hebrew, meaning that they pronounced a sov as a sov and a kometz as a kometz, rather than as the Sephardic pronunciation would have it, but their intonation, their accentuation was typical of the cheder, okay? which means that over time, two things happened to many, most, or maybe at some point, even all of these songs. They began to be sung by people who first of all used the Sephardi rather than the Ashkenazi pronunciation, which means that Savs were pronounced Tav and Kameitsim were pronounced Ah. But the second more striking change is that words started to be accented correctly rather than the way that they had been accented in the cheder. The ordinary rule in Hebrew, the rule of thumb in Hebrew, is that Hebrew words, generally speaking, are what we call milara. That is to say that the accent is on the final syllable. The exceptions to the rule are what we call milael, where the accent is on the penultimate syllable, the next to the last syllable. The, um, the traditional Eastern European Jewish pronunciation, right, tended to regard most words as being milael. Modern Hebrew, following the Sephardic tradition, recognizes, as I said, that most words are actually milara. So instead of shalom rav shuveich tzipora nechemedet, what you really have is that Bialik, when he wrote the poem, he was thinking of shalom rav shuveich tzipora nechemedet, which not only is a different intonation, as you can sense, it preserves a rhyme, right? Kind of like iambic pentameter, an alterna alternation of stressed and unstressed syllables. Obviously, if you're going to impose a rhyme scheme on a Hebrew sentence, you know, it, it's, it's just inevitable that you're going to, you know, to technically mispronounce certain words. So again, here is Nechama Hendel in her rendition uh, of this uh, poem. Coming through? Good. Ha 
So again, just a couple of points uh, to make uh, about this poem. Uh, in the second stanza, you see that he asks the bird in particular whether even in distant lands, tirbena haraot hatlaot. Remember that Bialik, right, lived through some of the more striking um, uh, instances of oppression of Jews in the Pale of Settlement and elsewhere in Eastern Europe and in Russia, right? Here's his famous poem about Ir HaHarega, about Kishinev. So um, what you have here is that Bialik is asking, you know, basically he, he's asking the bird to tell him, is, is it bad? Is it as bad elsewhere, right, as it is here at home, okay? And then of course it gets a little more, uh, a little, it gets a little brighter. Uh, and he asks specifically in the last stanza, uh, that we heard, um, he makes specific reference to places in the land of Israel. He mentions Har Hermon, right, which of course um, is mentioned already in the Torah. He mentions the Yarden. He talks about the Harim and the Gevaot, uh, etc. And the very final stanza, right, Kvar Kalu Hadmaot, right, that, that, you know, we're kind of exhausted, our tears have exhausted. All of the times in which we anticipated our exile to end have come and gone. And yet there seems to be no end, he says, to my torment, to my distress. So once again, he addresses the bird and he says, Shalom Rav Shuvech, welcome back. Tsipori Haikara, dear bird. Sahalina Kolech Varoni, at least let's take this opportunity to rejoice. If I could no, just I add, know. if Pardon? I could just add something parenthetically, in more recent times, the uh, Ethiopian Jews, uh, who recognized this migration pattern, wrote a song in Amharic, uh, asking the birds who came about the uh, what was going on in Jerusalem and praying, "How is Jerusalem from which you are returning?" and uh, praying for its welfare. Oh, thank you. Thanks. My pleasure. Now. Finally, come to uh, uh, a, a oldie but goodie, um, Tikva Tenu. Um, uh, better, of course, uh, and, and more uh, widely recognized as Hatikva, but of course, there are some differences. Not only is Tikva Tenu a lengthier poem than Hatikva, but here again, for the first time, we see um, where the texts of certain of these poems or old songs were altered on account of changing circumstances, okay? Um, the poem, as you can see, uh, if you can uh, see the uh, top line, right? The original name of the poem was Tikvatenu, Our Hope, okay? And it was written by Naftali Hertz Imber. Um, Imber, uh, a uh, uh, lived from 1856 to 1909, um, and between the years 1878 and 1884, he published several collections of his poems. So this is a poem that he himself worked on over an extended period of time, okay? So probably even when he finally published it, and we can take a quick look at one of its first uh, public appearances, um, he probably would have acknowledged that it was still a work in progress. So the fact that today we sing it to words that he didn't write is not at all, you know, an offense to him as the original poet, but as I said, it would be rather like um, extending his authorship to a more logical conclusion. 
you can certainly see embodied in the opening paragraphs of the poem, uh, the nucleus of what became the Zionist and the Israeli, and some would even call it the Jewish national anthem, Hatikva. Okay? Um, first of all, we have to invert the sequence of the first two stanzas. Okay? When Imber first published the poem, it began, Od lo avadatik vateno, our hope has not ended, which hope hatikva ha no shana, our ancient hope. And what is that hope? La shuv la eretz avoteno, to be able to return to our ancestral land, leir ba David chanan, specifically to David's city, to Jerusalem. I know that the text here says mishuv, but uh, I, I didn't want to tamper with the text as it appears on the website in case anybody would make a comparison, but there is, uh, there is considerable evidence that, uh, again, of all of the different versions of the poem that Imber himself produced, that the one that seems to have taken hold was not Mishuv, but Lashuv, to return. In fact, I, I, I heard from uh, uh, from uh, 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 people in my uh, grandparents' generation, that uh, when Zionists, when Zionist meetings were held, um, at the end of the meeting, people would say "Lomir zingen loshov," that they would end the meeting by singing the Hatikva. And since it wasn't yet called the Hatikva, because that is only the name that it was given when it became a national anthem, the, the nickname that they had for it was Lashuv, from the line Lashuv Le'eretz Avoteno. Uh, and again, the second stanza is the one that remains pretty much uh, intact, called Od Bilavavo Sham Penima, as long as within him, Nefesh Yehudi Homiya, uh, the soul of a Jew, of a Jew is uh, in turmoil, Ulafate Mizrach Kadima, and towards east, Sophia, his eye, he's constantly looking towards Zion. But the poem, of course, goes uh, beyond that. It originally had nine stanzas, and it has had a different number of stanzas, as I said, uh, depending upon which of the published versions one follows. Um, I'd like to do something interesting here, two things. One, share a little bit of information about the origin of the, of the name of the poem, Tikvatenu. Um, Imber was not a religious Jew, but he was an educated Jew. And Imber was acquainted with these verses in the book of Yechezkel. This is the end of the famous vision of Yechezkel known as the dry bones, in which he goes out to a valley that's filled with dry bones and the bones come together and they're dressed up in flesh and wind comes and inspires them and they come back to life. And as we see, uh, the first of the verses brought down here, I prophesied as God instructed me, and the wind entered into these skeletons and brought them back to life, and they arose, a, a vast multitude. And God says to the prophet Yechezkel, Ben Adam, who are these dry bones? Called Beit Yisrael Hema. They represent the house of Israel. They are the Jewish people. But why are they dry bones? Because in Neomrim, because they said or they thought of themselves, Yabushu Atzmotenu, our bones are dry, meaning we lack vitality, we lack the essence of life. Avidatik Vatenu, our hope. Our hope for salvation, our hope for redemption, right? Uh, Avida is lost. Nigzar ulanu, right? And our fate has been sealed. We are doomed. Therefore, God says to the prophet, Hinave, what is the subject of your prophecy? The object of your prophecy, Amarta Lehem. This is a message you should deliver to the house of Israel. Ko Amar Hashem Elokim, this is the word of God. Hinei kivrotechem. If you think yourself of yourselves as just skeletons, God, as it were, is going to open your tombs. 
and he will take you out of your tombs, right? This is obviously a metaphor for Jewish life in the diaspora, in the exile, right? God will take them out of the exile, and he will restore them to the land of Israel. This is the origin of the, of the title Tikvatenu, and you can see that it even incorporates the phrase Avida Tikvatenu. So in opposition to the people of whom Yechezkel prophesied, who thought that they were doomed and who described their, their doom as avedatik vatenu, hope for redemption is gone, he specifically, Davka, entitled his poem Tik Vatenu and introduced in it at the very beginning the line, Od Lo Avadatik Vatenu, that indeed, in truth, our hope has not yet vanished. I want to very quickly just share with you three things. You can do this on your own on the website. The link is here. Okay. You can hear renditions of Hatikva, of course. Um, you know, th th there are scores of renditions of Hatikva, but three that really struck me as being uh, significant, being singular. One was by Moshe Kosovitsky, arguably the greatest Chazan of his age, right? As a kid in Borough Park, I, I had the opportunity to hear him uh, in Bethel Synagogue on Shabbat Mevarchim, okay? So one is Moshe Kosovitsky, the second is, of course, the great tenor, Richard Tucker. And the third is a curiosity, Al Jolson, okay? uh, who, of course, got his role in the jazz singer because he was the son of a chazan. Okay? So th those are three renditions of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Hatikva uh, that you can uh, obtain on your own. Okay? But one that I think you might be particularly interested in, and I will share it with you, uh, is this one. Not what you might have expected. Eighteen eighty-six, I found out, titled Tikva Tenu, which means our hope. Um, it's deeply moving words are a prayer which suggests that as long as the heart within a jewish soul still yearns hope is never lost so tonight this very special occasion i sing this with the continued hope that we may learn from yesterday live for today and continue to strive for a better tomorrow feel free to join me as I say, you're beautiful national anthem. move on. As I said, the links are there. You can, you know, you can, uh, if you want to hear it again, you're certainly um, welcome to, uh, to do it. So let me just move us back. Okay. Now, this is what you've all been waiting for. Finally, a song that actually has the word Chalutzim in the title. 
The interesting thing is that I never knew that it was called Shira Chalutzim until I started investigating it. I only knew it by, uh, by the opening line. Um, if you can't see the opening line clearly here, uh, it's much clearer uh, here. Um, but uh, on this page, this is actually the first time that it ever appeared in print. It appeared in a journal called HaPoel HaTzair, because it was a workman's song, okay? Um, and uh, and I, I thought that just, you know, as a, as a, a uh, to, to share with you the, the original, uh, I only knew it uh, from its opening words, um, which I knew actually not as Anu Nihiyeh HaRishonim, but as Anu Nihiyeh HaRishonim. Uh, when I first heard it, when I first learned it, I, I learned it in its uh, original Ashkenazic version. Um, uh, and it was only when I started searching for it online that I discovered that it actually had a title, it actually had a name, and that its official name was actually Shir HaChalutzim. Um, it was composed during the construction of the Afula Nazareth Road, and it was written to mark the fact that this was the first time that uh, Jewish laborers were hired to do road work as opposed to Arab laborers. It, it, um, it appeared in print in, in, uh, in 1920. So apparently that's when it was written early on in the first year perhaps of the British mandate, right? The British employed Arabs and also Jews in a variety of what we would call infrastructure projects. So um, this is uh, one that uh, appeared first in 1920. Um, it would appear that the tune was borrowed from a, uh, a Yiddish workers song uh, that um, was well known at the time and, and therefore people could simply take a well-known tune and could adapt it to the new words. Um, and uh, it expresses uh, some of what we've come to see as, um, as typifying, as characteristic uh, of the, uh, the chalutzim, of the pioneering uh, society. Let me get the... Okay. Curious because um, this actually was sung by the official Israeli army uh, choir, the Lahakat Sahal. Um, so it's it's curious to, to hear, you know, but they understood that they couldn't sing it the way they might have read it. They had to sing it the way it was intended to be sung originally. Just a couple of points about it, as you can see, the, the background of, of, of building a road comes through in the words. Um, it comes through very clearly in the third paragraph, the last one that they sang, Anu Nasola Takvishim, we're the ones who are going to pave the roads. Nachtsob Tzorlav Negir, we're going to, as it were, uh, carve the roads through the mountains, right? Heydad Yanu Apatishim, the, the hammers, the jackhammers, right, will all celebrate. Bishirenu Etashir as we sing the song. But it's already there really in the first stanza. Um, 
Neit Hametar Neit Anach. Neit is um, uh, arguably the, the, uh, the imperative of the verb lintot, to reach out. Uh, uh, nete, instead of biblical Hebrew, would be nete, right? So here they have nate. Uh, a metar, um, which also means a, a, a chord, a string uh, on a guitar or on a, a, a violin, uh, is obviously a, um, a measuring device. And the anach is the plumb line. So what we have a reference to in the opening stanza, the metar and the anach are obviously the, the surveyor's uh, tools that, um, that drew the lines uh, for the road that they then had to carve its way uh, through the rocks. So uh, here we finally at least uh, have come to uh, what is uh, at least a, uh, a shir chalutzim. Now I'll tell you in all candor, um, uh, since this really is a, a, a new venture, um, I, I had no idea when I started out just, you know, how much time it would take, uh, how much of the songs to, to play, uh, et cetera. Um, so uh, I see that we're already close to the closing time, and there are a lot of things on the chat that I have to look through. So um, there are several items that we didn't cover that are part of today's source sheets, but we'll... Uh, we'll somehow incorporate them into uh, subsequent classes. So let me take a quick look here uh, at the chat um, and see what I can uh, respond to. Oh, I see there are some, sec some recommendations here. Uh, I will certainly take note of them. Um, and- uh, Dr. Sokolow, sure you Dr. Sokolow? Yes. You don't. You don't need to write those down. I'll copy the chat for you, and I'll send it to you in an email. Oh, thank you. Okay. So let me just then look through what if there are specific um, uh, questions. Yes, Kiryat Ekron is not near Mazkeret Batya. Uh, Mazkeret Batya was Ekron. If there is now a place called Kiryat Ekron in addition to it, then just somebody capitalized on the on the name. Yes, uh, Rebels in the Holy Land. Uh, is the book somebody uh, said they actually reviewed it. Uh, this is the book that tells somewhat of a lengthy story, uh, tells the story uh, of these um, 10 uh, pioneering uh, farming families uh, in what came to become as Karet Batya, in which there actually is still a synagogue on the name of Rabbi Shmuel Mulliver uh, in recognition of his important role in getting them there. Um, yeah. No, um, uh, as I said, Naftali Hertzimbra was not a religious Jew, but he certainly was an educated one. Uh, my grandfather actually had, uh, knew him. Uh, Imbra died in 1909 in, in, uh, while living in New York City. In fact, he was originally buried in Mount Zion Cemetery in Queens. Uh, in 1953, uh, in recognition of his being the author of the Hatikva, uh, his body was reinterred. Uh, in Jerusalem, uh, but uh, he did live for a while in the United States. Um, yeah, uh, Smetan is Moldau. Uh, there, there's, there is still to this very day a, a machloket uh, as to who made the shidduch between the tune and the words. Um, and again, there's a pshat answer and a drash answer. One answer is, that this was a well-known Romanian folk tune. Uh, and um, since a lot of the people living in Israel at the time of the early pioneers came from Romania, uh, they just simply did it themselves. Okay? Um, another story that I heard uh, from uh, someone who was born, uh, someone who was the first generation born in Petach Tikva, told me that, um, again, because of Smetna's Moldau, because of the existence of this tune as a Romanian folk tune, it was used on the Yamim HaNoraim and the Shalosh Regalim in Petach Tikva for Vahavienu Litzion Yercha. Right? Vahavienu Litzion Yercha, Litzion Yercha Berina. And therefore, since it already had it already had, uh, the tune had already made its way into something that was reminiscent of the return to Zion. That's what influenced it becoming the tune of Hatikva. But if you look on the website, you'll find a link to a segment of a Romanian movie, right? In which there is a song 
called the ox cart. <laughs> and if you and if you ignore the Romanian words and listen only to the tune, it's not Smetnas Molda. It's not just the recording. Na 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 na. Not just that. It's Hatikva, note by note. So there's that. Okay. Um, wow. Sixteen oh three fifty third Street. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Well, my, my, like your parents, Debbie. My parents, you know, uh, were Hashomer uh, Adati, Apol Amizrahi. So again, you know, I, I I I love these songs because of the songs that I you know that I heard as a kid. But before we leave uh, for today, I also want to make another uh, confession, and that is that it wouldn't have occurred to me to tr to attempt this if I hadn't read this book um, uh, over the uh, fall. Uh, <clears throat> it's a rather remarkable book. It's called Shir Hularak Milim, which actually are the words of a song, right? There's a song called Shir Shir Hularak Milim, right? Songs are not only words. Um, yeah. It's written by a very well uh, uh, respected uh, Israeli historian named David Asaf. Um, and he has a, uh, a blog called Erev Shabbat. Yeah. And occasionally in his Erev Shabbat blog, he investigated the mm -hmm. roots of some of these uh, Hebrew songs. And eventually he put, uh, you know, about uh, 15 of them together into a book. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was so taken with the book, I so enjoyed reading it, that that's basically what gave me the, um, the, uh, the stimulated me um, to uh, put all these songs together uh, and to share them with you. So once again, uh, thank you all for joining us uh, today uh, on, this, um, on this pioneering voyage uh, into uh, pioneering songs. And I look forward to seeing uh, all of you or as many of you as possible uh, next Tuesday at uh, 11 o'clock. Shira, back to you. Dr. Thank Sokolo, you. hi. I just, I, I just got out. Oh, Rabbi minutes. Kelman. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just heard the last two minutes that I saw the comments. So fascinating. Everybody enjoyed it. So I'll have to listen later. But anyways, I just wanted to say hello and welcome back. Thank you. So, um, Yashar Koach. But uh, nice. I, I guess we didn't do any singing today, actual singing. But that's okay. Well, I, 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 I heard that people will sing along on their own when the that's music it, is That's it. That's it. As long as they're know. muted, they can sing as much as they want. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay. Amazing. Anyways, thank I you. Want to, I want to tell you I enjoyed so much as someone who was... <laughs> seventh generation from Jerusalem. I know really all the songs and it really touched oh. my heart. It's beautiful. Thank, Thank you so you. much. More her Hama, her, she could probably sing. Her 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 husband, of course, was a great chazan, world class, class chazan. So I, I don't know what your voice is like, Rucham, but anyway. Yeah, it's just I, like amazing, yes. I, I enjoyed all you. the songs. I know them. It means so much to me. It's history. Our songs are history. Not just words. It is thank you, but thank you very much, Rabbi, and to the Rabbi. Do okay, you thank you. Okay, uh, you know, you okay, think... Rabbi Shulman and, and one hour on Sefer Daniel, and then the uh, Rabbi Help God is not speaking this week. Our regular uh, shiurim during the week, Daniel Rabbi Rabbi Daniel Fridman will give the Parsha shiur on Thursday, uh, mm -hmm. and then my shiur on the Sitter on uh, on Friday. Uh, right. Tomorrow, Lindsay Guhartz will be speaking her series on Christianity and Rabbi Levine continuing part two on development of the Shemar. Oh, uh, next, we will have a few new series that are, are beginning. Well, I, I mentioned last night, um, Rabbi Liebtag, of course, will start a new series on chronology in, in, in the Bible. Uh, yeah. When in the, when in the Torah is, in, is not in chronology, and uh, Adam Mintz will be giving a four part series on the history of the Arab, including he, that's what he wrote his PhD thesis on. He just came up with the book on the history of Aravine. And um, he will give, of course, a talk for those who live in Toronto. One of his four talks will be on the history of the Toronto Arab. And uh, I'm happy to announce, so we'll send you details that in the near future, Shuli Mishkin will be back giving another series. So we got lots going on here and uh, hope to learn with you. And uh, I don't know, Shir, if you want to say anything, but uh, I'm going to go back to school and uh, Everybody have a wonderful day. Hope to see you soon. And thank you, Dr. Sokolo. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Sokolo, do you think that there was, there's any communist influence in any of the songs? The one of the road builders sounds very much 
like a song to att attract her. We'll get there. We'll get there. Yes, indeed. There, there, there is very pronounced communist influence on some of the songs. We will get some of them. In fact, are actually uh, Russian songs, socialist songs that were translated into Hebrew, or some passed through Yiddish on their way to Hebrew. Uh -huh. Yes, indeed. Thank okay. Doctor Sokolo, I see. I see Paul. Paul has his hand up. Paul, are you still there? Do you have a question before we go? Well, maybe he's just waving, so I'll wave back. <laughs> Paul, now's your chance. We're about Paul to end the meeting. Okay. 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 The blog maybe, is called, okay. David Asaf's blog is called Oneg Shabbat, not Erev Shabbat. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. But it, comes out, it comes out on Friday. Thank Correct. you. Correct. It's excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks to everyone for being here. We look forward to seeing you here same time next week. Have a good week. Shavua Tov. Thank you, Dr. Sokolo. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Great.